generationally, there's always something exciting going on in technology for personally for me back to kindergarten, like that first Apple II Plus, which I still have, you know, open doors to me and each technology continues to open those doors wider. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode four, Ron Richards. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons like Joe Esposito and Andy Strunk. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell and support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello, and welcome to the Techsploder podcast. I'm Jason Howell, and this week's guest is Ron Richards, my good friend, podcaster, pinball lover, and tech enthusiast. Once a host and marketing director at Revision 3, Ron co-founded iFanboy in 2001, as well as the pinball tech company Scorbit in 2015 with Jay Adelson. He's also worked for major comic book publishers like Image Comics and Marvel. Ron was the co-founder and co-host of the original All About Android podcast for Twit, along with me, and now co-hosts the Android Faithful podcast for the DTNS Podcast Network. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. Mr. Ron Richards, my good friend on the internet for so, so many years. It's good to have you here on Texploder Podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. My brother in podcasting. Uh, That's right. One one of my brothers in podcast. I I have such a great podcasting family and I'm I'm, I'm honored to have you a part of it. So, yeah. Yeah, man. I I so appreciate you in my life, both uh, on a professional level and on a personal level. You have just been such a a wonderful, constant kind of friend in, uh, in my, you know, Starting with my career, but then yeah. kind of branching out of that and everything. I, I only wish that we lived in the same kind of like the same geographical area so we could see each other more. I mean, yeah, I, I totally agreed. And it's funny because I was I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about like, you know, a, you know, the, the adult friends conundrum, especially when you're when you have kids yeah. and your parents and stuff like that. And ever since I moved from New York City out to Long Island, where I am currently, um, I, I don't have any, I, I literally do not have a single friend in my zip code. Um, Oof, and, that's and, hard, but no, but it's, but it's okay though, because we live in 2024 and I've got this amazing group of friends that stretch out across the country. And thanks to yeah. technology and thanks to the internet, I'm in probably more contact with than if we lived in the same city, right? Like mm. you imagine our lives without texting and without Slack or Discord and all the and WhatsApp and all the various things. And I'm able to have really strong, healthy, you know, really fulfilling friendships with you in, in you know North Bay, you know, uh, north of the Bay Area, friends in LA, guy, friends in New Hampshire, friends in Michigan, friends in Chicago. Fr- you know, like it's it's uh, it's lucky that, that that we can stay connected in this way because twenty years ago, we, we were thirty years ago, we're writing letters or we're we're paying long distance phone charges to stay in touch. Right? Yeah, we're so, picking uh, up the phone and yeah. having a conversation exactly. on a call where we can't see the person on the other side, like yeah. or we're connecting oh. on a on a bulletin board system or something. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but no. No, so I mean, like in the in the spirit of Texploder here, it's like I'm thankful for you, and I'm thankful for the technology that keeps us to, and our friendship alive. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. You know, I was thinking about this kind of leading up to this conversation, trying to think about the first time you and I met, and would that be like face to face? Would that be South by Southwest? I think it was this. I think it was Dignation, the South by Southwest, maybe oh eight or oh nine or so. Um, I might even have a picture of that. In oh my yeah, th- there is a picture. The picture exists. Is a picture of you, me, and Tom Merritt. Um, yeah. And I was at the time I was working at Revision Three, and I was on the Dignation train. I was running marketing for Revision Three, um, and you could tell the pic because I've got we, we had all these wristbands for different levels of access, right? Like you get it, like yeah. twenty one and over, or you get backstage or whatever. And I had every wristband on my wrist. We were at Stubbs in Austin, um, <laughs> and and that was after you know really years of listening to you and Tom on Buzz Out Loud. I think that was ironically, right. you know, both living in San Francisco. That was the first time we met in Austin in person. Um, and, and I was taken aback by how tall you were. So. <laughs> As everyone seems to be. Everybody's so, you know, when I, when I meet people who listen to our shows, I mean, it's probably the same for you, right? When you meet someone in person, they've always got a comment. They've always got some sort of like idea of who you are yep. based on the voice that they've heard. You know, they yep. may have never even seen you until they do one day. And they're like, wow, you look nothing like the, 
the yeah. person I thought you looked like based on your voice. But for me, it's always the height. It's, it's always the height. Like, and wow, for me, really for me, it's the sideburns. It's always the sideburns. Yeah. So, yeah, so, <laughs> Which um, are characteristic. Yeah. I think exactly. you've had the sideburns for as long as since, I've known you. Anyways. Oh, since high school. I grew, I grew them in high school and have had them ever since. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you were one of those. Uh, I, was, I had a good friend in high school that was can, the sideburn guy. You can blame uh, <laughs> Luke Perry and 90210 on, on my sideburn choice. So. <laughs> well, yes. So anyone who watches or Rest listens piece, to – yeah. uh, Android faithful slash all about Android over the years mm-hmm. knows that you are a big 90210 fan. Indeed. And Indeed. Uh, so that, and that's where the sideburns kind of came from yep. for the most part. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. I, like I just want to, I, I, I just want to look cool. No, honestly, honestly, I, I retroactively blame 90210 for it. But honestly, yeah. w- once I was in high school and like started shaving, I didn't know you had to shave that far back, right? Like I just always shaved the front. <laughs> and then next thing I knew, I had grown these things down the side. And it, at the same time, everyone on 902 and side were in. So I'm like, oh, I'll just go with it. But like, it was purely from my ignorance of like, no one ever, my father never taught me how to shave. And so I just thought you just did the front and didn't go all the way up my ear. So yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And we didn't have the internet back when exactly. you were in high yeah. school. <laughs> uh, as maybe, you know, I can only point that out because I think you and I are pretty much the same age. So, you know, we're we're equally as old I, as each other. I so the first time I got on the internet was in high school. It was in ninety four, maybe. Um, it uh, it was right when you know the consumer internet kind of like the very early days. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was on Mosaic. It was pre Netscape. Um, mm. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I technically was on the internet in high school, didn't know what to do with it. And, and it was just this neat thing, a, a different way to connect. Um, I was already, um, I was already very active in the BBS scene, uh, the yeah. board system scene. So like, so the idea of connecting to another computer in the world wasn't foreign to me, but the idea of an always on connection or not one that you like that you dial to an ISP. And then that was a gateway to go via this browser to go all these other places that was, you know, like everyone at the time was mind blowing. So. Yeah, indeed. Um, indeed. When you think about, so, so that's kind of like your earliest internet memory. Like it, are there, are there early internet memories that you can think of that were that that are like pinnacle moments for you or maybe they were eye opening or maybe they were just like oh my goodness like this is this is so much greater so much bigger than I ever thought was was even possible. Well, yeah, and and, and honestly, for me, that was pre-internet. So I I was very very lucky and very and benefited from the fact that I am the son of a computer engineer. Um, mm. My dad, my dad, uh, had an affinity for technology and engineering. Uh, coming out of uh, the Vietnam War, uh, he got drafted and quickly realized that you know. They, they, they identified he had engineering capability, and, and he thought, well, hey, if I fix radios, they, they'll keep me as far away from the front versus yeah. if I fix guns where I'll be up at the front. So he spent the Vietnam War in Georgia and in South Carolina, and I think the furthest he got abroad was uh, like the Canary Islands and the Azores mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, but uh, he that combined with the fact that he got a perfect on the SATs um, – Parlay like, like literally a perfect. Literally got a got a 1600 on the SATs. Like didn't get a question wrong. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow. Yeah. Try growing up with that above you. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did no not. kidding. I did not. But um, but so that that coming out of the service, he was able to parlay that into a uh, a, scho- a full ride scholarship uh, to wherever where he wanted to go, and he went to Polytech here in in New York, and then that then transitioned into computers. Um, and he actually worked at a he was at a company that was in the race for the personal computer in the late seventies, uh, they were called Ontel, O N T E L, not Intel, Ontel, um, and uh, the they, other Tel. Yeah, exactly. They were based. The other blank Tel. Yeah, they were based here. <laughs> they were based here in the in the tech hub of Long Island, New York. Um, where, but they were trying to, you know, they had a PC, you know, CRT and a, a CPU and everything, and they were going to the shows. Like, if you ever watch Halt and Catch Fire. Yes. Um, that TV show, the first season of that TV show was very echoing. Uh, like that could have been my dad, like the company that like had a computer and was going to Comdex and things like that. Like it was very mm-hmm. kind of thing. But mm-hmm. so I just grew up with technology all around me. You know, my ba- still to this day, my parents' basement is full of eight inch drives and eight inch floppy disks and big old hard drive platters that hold five megabyte uh, of data. Wow. Um, so like I always had, always had computers around me. My dad put me in front of an Apple two plus at four years old, five years old, maybe like kindergarten. So very, very early. Um, and then at some point between kindergarten and middle school, he brought home a deck vax, 
Um, and this is, you know, the, this is really dating myself, but, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Digital Electronics Com Corporation um, uh, and they had a they had a PC called a Vax. And my mom was active in education and there was some it was a moment in time where they were connecting me and other kids I went to school with via the computer with kids in Australia. And we were we were chatting. And, ah, okay. and so like here I am in the mid 80s typing on a computer and like, hi, where are you? And they're like, we're in Sydney. Where are you? Oh, like the, that's mind the, blowing. Yeah. So yeah, so that was really the first kind of like, oh wow, like this is this is a technology that can connect people and can do things with it. And it was just a chat. It was just a back and forth chat. Um, but it really felt like, it felt like at a Star Trek. It's like, I'm talking to someone in mm -hmm. Australia, like this is insane. And so then that led me into getting into bulletin board systems into BBSs because the idea, because we had a modem and I was like, well, dad, we have this modem. What can I do? We, like, like we can't connect to Australia all the time. What can I do with it? So there was a couple of um, like local Long Island based, you know, BBSs that were, I don't even know what they, what, what they were, what they did, but it was cool because you dialed into it and there was message boards and things like that. And then I discovered more and more. And at the same time, I'm playing PC games and then discovered that there's a vibrant pirate pirate community amongst bulletin board systems. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so, uh, you know, when I find out I can get any computer game I want without paying for it, I'm in. So, um, and, uh, and, and at that point, were you sticking to your local kind of no. BBS offerings or no. were you no, expanding no, no. out? At I, I expanded a little because the good BBSs weren't in your area. Code. Yeah, and so, of yeah, course, yeah. So, of course so, they weren't. So there was a lot of like, wait until I forget what time the cutoff was, but wait until the long distance calling was cheaper and connect to the BBS and then start downloading your zip files of the latest King's Quest game or whatever it is and do it overnight. Um, the BBS, it was insane because I remember the BBSs, you know they were they were limited by how many phone lines they had coming in. for you know, for, for mm -hmm. your listeners for you you know not old people like us bulletin board system was a PC connected via modem to a phone line and someone else on a computer with a modem could dial your phone number and connect and the modems would talk to each other so Directly any to your BBS, computer so yeah. any BBS was only limited by the number of connections it had by the number of phone lines so if the BBS was mm -hmm. on one phone line one person was on at a time so i would spend you call and you get the busy line and all that was the I worst i would spend yep. hours you know, hours just trying, you know, I had my list of BBSs. Let me see if I can get into this one. Let me see if I can get into this one. Right. Um, and then I was able to write scripts to just keep dialing until one connected and then do an alarm and run back to the computer. And then once you got connected, there were message boards. Um, there was active conversations, which that was another pre-internet, but there was a syndicated network of message boards where if you wrote a message on one BBS, it went out to all the other participating ones. So you could talk to mm -hmm. more people than just on the BBS. Um, but so I got really into that. I hosted my own BBS for a while, uh, which was fun. Um, I may or may not have been involved in some illegal computer game pirating, which I, I won't. I won't. Um, <laughs> is the statute of limitations over from things you did when you were 10? I think so. But yeah. I talked about my history, and yeah. I'm sure I'll talk about it at yeah. some point on Text no, Loader. I, I, yeah. I, was a, I was a courier for one of the, the cracking groups, and so I would get the game and then upload it to, to <gasps> and do all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, and That's I was, fascinating. And I was like 11. So like, yes. Yeah. Right. Well, this is what, this is what kind of blows my mind, man, is that of all the people, all walks of life online and everything yep. that you and I, our paths crossed when they did. And, you know, we become such a, a an integral part of each other's lives in this yep. very, you know, specific part of our lives, which is, you know, podcasting and technology and even more specific Android and everything. Yep. Yet, you know, similar to, you know, episode one, I talked with Tom Merritt, similar to Tom, like all these people that cross my path, the more I get to know you and Tom and everybody, the more I realize our stories are so similar because I mean, you're basically telling the story of, you know, telling my story as well when you're talking yeah. about that, you know, maybe different facets, but, um, and, and I suppose part of that is just, you know, we're very similar ages. We were had a very similar passion in technology at the same time. Yeah. So the same things kind of bubble up for us, but a courier for the cracking groups, that yep. is fascinating. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, was... that's an aspect of it that I was not close to. Oh yeah, no, it was, and it was funny because I was such a stupid kid. Like it was just so like, well, yeah. like absolutely illegal. Um, and like, and I'm also like, I'm meeting other people on these bulletin board systems and we all have these dumb handles, right? So you don't know anyone's actual real names. And I remember like one guy, there was another guy on Long Island who gave me his phone number and I called his house and I realized I didn't know his name. So I, I'm like, is Shadow Demon there? And like, and then like, and whoever answered the phone, like, 
exhaled and like they're like Sanjeev you have a phone call and it was and it was, just, and it was like he's like dude why'd you use my handle I'm like I didn't know your name and like so it was just definitely it was it was a weird weird time and it was a weird experience but it really it it it, it really continued to lay the groundwork and I I owe it all I, everything I've done in my career and everything I've done in adulthood I owe it to those experiences because yeah. it it. It it built a sensibility in me that like the computer is a tool to do things with, right? And that mm. and like the one through line through my entire career and through my personal interests and things like that has been the computer is a tool for publishing, and a computer is a tool for connecting with people, right? Um, and so you know, so being able to you know that be, that early BBS systems was like the idea of se- the idea of setting up a BBS and you come up with a name and you did all your ASCII art and you had your mm-hmm. handle and all this sort of stuff and you wanted people to come join your BBS. That's that's starting a website. That's starting a podcast. That's publishing a magazine. That the all things I've done in in my life after that, it's all the same of how can you use this tool and this computer tool to to connect with other people. So. Yeah, and the eye-opening kind of recognition that we now definitely take for granted. Yep. Uh, back then was like, oh, wait a minute, I can do this now because I have this thing. Yeah. And it seemed so unattainable. And man, that is that is just a theme that has been repeated throughout my lifetime in technology yep. is something seems unattainable. And then I realized that the technology that I use or that I have within reach becomes better, more powerful, more capable to where suddenly that barrier is broken down yep. and now it's been totally democratized. I mean, it's, we're seeing that insanely now. It's, that's so fun. That's it's you're true. And that's so funny that you just said those exact words because do you want to know what the name of my BBS was? What's that? Barrier breakers. Barrier breakers. And like when I was right like 11 on. or 12, it was you know, the barrier breakers BBS, right? Like that was, you know, and, um, but yeah, that's totally, that's totally true. And like, at least for me, and I was, you know, going into this interview, I was thinking about like, how do I use technology and things like that? I can't say that I've ever been in a spot where like I have a vision of this thing I want to do and the computer is enabling me to do it. For me, it was always the other way around of like, oh, wow, look at what I can do. What can I do with this? How can I use this? What can I do with it? Right. And so like all of my own like entrepreneurial initiatives and stuff like that have purely come out of a little bit of boredom, a lot of curiosity, and a lot of like trying to find an application because I know I know this mouse and keyboard give me power, can let me do something with it. Mm. What can I do? And then I craft what I what I did based off what I would want to see. So like going back to the internet, I remember getting on Mosaic and the first website I went on um, was at the University of Pennsylvania, UPenn, UPenn.edu. Somebody had put up a, uh, a a page dedicated to Star Wars. And it was all, it had a Starfield background and it had the yellow Star Wars logo on black, right? Rude Mary. Um, I thought it was crazy that, that, it, that it wasn't a gray background because every web page I had, had had the transparent gray mosaic background. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And they just had a bunch of sound files of like recordings from the movies and like, and I thought it was the greatest thing ever, right? And yes. it, it took me several years to come up with my own application of what I would want to do on the web, but it was you know, watching the web grow from that, like that point in 1994 until, you know, 2000, when I built my first website and started getting into web publishing, those five years of being a consumer of seeing it evolve, seeing HTML evolve into JavaScript and involve, you know, like, you know, keep in mind, like there's no Ajax, there was no server side Mm -hmm. calls. It was all push, push, Mm push. Um, and really trying to wrap my head around and understand. I taught myself HTML in college again because I was bored. You know, taught myself JavaScript. You know, just because I really wanted to be involved in it, but I didn't have a, a reason to. Right. So, um, but yes, yeah, it was wild. It was definitely, I do remember uh, my entire life is littered by missed opportunities in technology. Also, and the first one was um, when Netscape went public. When Netscape IPO'd, um, mm-hmm. I remember because I'd used Mosaic, and when Netscape came out, and um, you know, I was like the only person in my peer group in high school that was active on the internet and active in, you know, I was in the computer lab and they're like, what the hell? Um, you had an email address and all this stuff. Like when my, when my older friends went to college in 1994, they all got email addresses from their college. Yeah. And I signed up with an ISP to get an email address so I could email them. And they all thought I would, they're like, you already have an email address. Like it was, yeah, it was, mm. it was great. I mean, but, 94 um, was early. Yeah. yeah 94 was, was early. Yep. But, mm-hmm. um, uh, but then I, uh, summer 95, I was actually on tour, uh, roadieing for a band and I remember being somewhere in the Midwest 
and get, getting the paper at the McDonald's and seeing the front page news that Netscape had gone IPO. And I had remembered a couple of weeks before the tour saying to my dad, I'm like, this Netscape company is going to go public and people are going to make a lot of money. And, gee, you know, like at, at 17 or 18, yeah, having my first like stock market miss, I was like, uh, I was like, I knew it. I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to capitalize right, on it. So, right. So, yeah. yeah. I should remember this for the next time I have a great <laughs> idea like this and actually do it. And then Not even an idea. Are, I, just, like, I, thought, I thought I could buy the stock and make millions. And like that's. Yes. What, but yeah. But um, August, I just I just Googled it. August 9th, 1995. Netscape goes IPO. Yep. So wow, um, when when you're talking about desktop publishing, because publishing, I know that you had a zine back I when did. you were yep. younger, right? That's another one of the the strange kind of synergies between you and me. Yeah. Um, the, how how did you do publishing on that? Was that with your computer, or were you doing it, you know, kind of old school, you know, tape and pieces of you know, so art to p- paper and a that little sort bit of, of stuff? a little bit of both. So basically, what had yeah. happened was is that um, I I was very lucky to go to a high school that had that was well funded. Um, we had in my the town and you up. just said you had internet at that high yeah, school. Yeah, right? so, yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so I went. I to don't pub- remember having access yeah. to that that early. Yeah. So I went to public school. And there's uh, the the Long Island uh, Power Company at the time it was called Lilco. In the '50s, they built a they built a plant on the shore. I'm I'm on the water in Long Island. Um, there are four stacks. I can see them from my window right now. There are four smokestacks. And part of the deal in the '50s when they built this was that they would pay an, a ridiculous amount of ta- taxes for the land that they used. And the town decided to funnel that all into the schools. So going to high school in the '90s, I had a film class. We had a computer lab that had you know that had complete internet access and all the stuff like that. Um, there also was a there was a class you could take for journalism, and the journalism class produced the school paper. Um, and so this is, you know, and you can only take it junior and senior year. And so junior year, I took it and I fell in love because it was like, this is so cool. This is using the computer to publish. And, and it was using Aldous PageMaker. Um, and that's where I learned desktop publishing for the first time with a WYSIWYG kind of, you know, interface. Um, mm-hmm. And I just, I, had, I fell in love with pu- the concept of publishing. At the time, I was already a big magazine nerd. I got, I, I subscribed to Entertainment Weekly in its first year. Um, I didn't, just, I, I hadn't subscribed to Wired yet. I remembered when I was on that tour, uh, we stayed at somebody, somebody's apartment in Ohio and the girl's boyfriend was a, was a computer programmer. And on the shelf, he had every issue of Wired on the shelf. And like, remember how Wired had like that, the mm-hmm. colored spine. So it just looked yep. like the coolest thing. I was like, what is this? He's like, oh, it's a computer. It's a, it's a, a magazine about technology. And I just flipped through all the magazines. I thought they, I thought Wired was like the greatest thing in the world in 1995. Yeah. But, um, but uh, in doing the school paper, I fell in love with the concept of publishing. And so um, I was able, you know, I got, I got the so- through my dad, I got the software on my own computer. And then I go to college. And um, at the same time, I'm active in the underground punk and hardcore scene. Um, you know, on Long Island, I, you know, I, I, all my friends were in bands. I used to go to shows uh, for a little bit. I book shows. I, I'm not musical. Like, I'm not like you, Jason. Like, I can't, I tried to play guitar. I tried to sing. I, try, I can't do it. Try to play drums. I can't do any of it. But I just mm-hmm. Wanted to be involved in the scene in some way, shape, or form, and in high school I did that by booking shows. There was a skate park here where we built a stage, and then I booked the Bouncing Souls and Seven Seconds and some really cool punk bands and stuff like that. Right on. Um, helped helped to get Fugazi, not at my venue, but at another venue, and so like that was cool times. And then I get to college, and I'm in a new town. I don't really know anybody. Um, you know, there's, there, there are other punk and hardcore kids there that I'm starting to learn, but there's already one venue and one kid was booking it. So I didn't want to like horn in on that. So I didn't decide not to book And I'm like, well, let me do a zine. Like zine, zine, I was getting maximum rock and roll. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think punk planet had come out as our punk planet was just starting to come out. Um, heart attack was another zine under the volcano. So I was already getting my news about bands and music from zines. I was like, well, I have the tools. I have the computer. Let me do that. Um, and one of my friends worked at Kinko's in the overnight, uh, shift. (laughs) And so me and uh, another friend of mine, we used to hang out at Kinko's and we would make flyers there and all this sort of stuff. Um, and my other friend, Dave was already doing a zine. He had done six issues of his zine already. And he was saying how he wanted to do more of it. And I was like, yeah, I want to do a zine, but I don't want to do photocopied. Like I want to like get it printed on newsprint. I want to make a real magazine. And he's like, cool, let's do a flip zine where that way we can save on costs where like one side will be mine, one side will be yours. And if you flip it upside down, you're like that sort of thing. And ah. as we, yeah, but as we started doing it, we're like, hey man, let's just join forces. And so we joined forces and uh, we created a zine called Muddle. Um, 
and we picked up his numbering. So he was on a seventh issue. So my first issue was issue number seven because that way it looks like we've been around. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, It 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 helped with advertisers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we found I found a, a local the the people who printed the local paper in Ithaca like the the Ithaca News I was like you know I figured out how much was to pay um, to get it printed and we did a thirty two page print zine and I interviewed uh, the singer of Jawbreaker and a, a whole bunch of other bands and it was kind of off to the races and we ended up doing we would do maybe one or two issues a year because we're also in school. Um, mm-hmm. but the big factor for me was that I was straight edge, so I didn't drink or I didn't party. I, so like if I wasn't at a show in Ithaca or driving to New York city to go see shows, I was just in my dorm room board and that's why I wanted to do the zine. And so I had my PC, I had a flatbed scanner, you know, like I saved up my money to get a big monitor and using the computer as a tool, I was able to create this zine that turned into a magazine. And by the time we stopped doing it, it was like 200 pages, full color cover, distributed in Barnes and Noble and Tower Records and all that fun stuff. So it was no a fun- kidding. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't realize that yours had had become such a success. How many issues beyond the the starting point of seven did you get? Um, I think I always forget. I think we did about ten or so. I think we stopped around issue fifteen or sixteen. So so what around a big there. accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. Um, ben uh, Gibbard from Death Cab for Cutie used to write for us mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. Death Cab was anything. Like I have, I have you know issues of the zine where Ben interviewed other bands. Like yeah, so it's yeah. like it was definitely cool. It was definitely a cool community thing. Um, but and it was also like what was funny was that the first website I built was for that zine, but it wasn't like. I wasn't publishing articles. It was totally like, it was brochureware. It was like, mm-hmm. here's where the zine is. Here's the latest information about the new issue. Here's the address to send your money to get a copy. Right. And I didn't think like, oh, I could also be publishing to the web until after 2000, until after college, till after 2000. Um, right. But, but again, well, that was also yeah. during a time where, where everybody was really also yeah. figuring that out as, yeah. as it went along. You know, does it make sense for us to, put all of this online or do we stick with the traditional model that we've been doing for you know many decades at yep. this point yep. yeah it, th- those those uh those kind of shifts in thinking and that paradigm shift takes time and so and and again my and then my second missed opportunity was that we were basically doing what pitchfork was doing before pitchfork yeah. and had i just right. a pl- had i not focused on the print element and focused on the web who knows what that could have been, right? So that was yeah. missed opportunity number two. But um, I, and I've, I've I've been flirting with scanning all the zines and trying to do a book of it or something like that. But um, a lot of it is pretty cringe. Like we used to we used to we used to ask guys in bands how to ask girls out, and like it was just like really just like not <laughs> not good. And yeah, but um, uh, but it was fun, and I got you know, and and it gave me a way to participate in that scene and also to use technology. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, you said flatbed scanner, and that just it immediately took me back to the time when I got my full color flatbed scanner. That was magical. Oh you know, again, saved, it was one of those I things saved, that we take for granted. Now. I worked my ass off to set. I think it was like seven hundred dollars. It was yeah, but like yeah. once I had that flatbed, because the thing was, we used to go to. There were, I went to Ithaca College, and there was a flatbed scanner in a library at Cornell that one of our friends from the punk scene worked at. Uh, this, this guy, who he ran a record label. He did a record label called Immigrant Sun Records, this guy Sean. Um, to give you context, his nickname was Old Man Sean because he was 24, right? <laughs> 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 so, oh, so, um, but uh, he worked at the library and he was like, yeah, when I'm at work, you can come in and use the scanner here. So I would come in with my stack of photos. Like I'd go see bands and take pictures with a disposable camera and make the prints and scan each picture and then save them to a zip drive and then bring the zip, bring the zip disc home and plug it into my zip drive and then bring them into PageMaker and then eventually Quark and start doing the layout. And um, I, I taught myself design. I taught myself photography. I taught myself, like, I mean, some of the layouts are just awful. Some of them I'm pretty proud of, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. I, I took a while for me to learn the rule of don't use more than two fonts on a page, right? Like, headline yeah, font, that's body always font. The, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, especially in those days, man. Yeah. It's like, I remember I, I had an, uh, you know, an old Apple Mac uh, computer or Apple computer. Um, and um, I remember just seeing the, the whole list of fonts when I was doing yep. my zine and just oh, wanting to use them all the and best. just not knowing like, eh, maybe you don't want to do that. <laughs> well, there, there's an important lesson that I did learn in doing that is that just because you can doesn't yes. mean you should. 
Yeah. Right? And so like, and so I, it, so I evolved my own de- uh, design sensibility. And like I mentioned wired when I saw uh, the magazine ray gun, which I don't, which I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's any relation to your nickname, your ray gun nickname. No, no but okay, it would yeah. always come up when I was like <laughs> wanting to buy a URL or doing yeah. a search for, you know, when my DJ name was ray gun, you yeah. know, it was, it was always there. But, um, but yeah, there was, there was a magazine called ray gun that was just like bonkers design, like visual design. If you ever want to like mm-hmm. Google ray gun magazine, you can see what I'm looking at. So that was really like a foil of like what could be done. I'm like, oh, what if I put the name of the band sideways or whatever? And like we did one full issue parroting 17 and like sassy, like we did like a girl, you know, like a girl's teen magazine. Um, yeah, it was fun. It was it was definitely one of my favorite things I've ever done. Um, and what was great was that I went from being very active in a local music scene on Long Island to then moving up to upstate New York and doing the zine. And because I was I was disconnected from my local scene and we were dependent on touring bands coming through because Ithaca did had a small scene as well. The zine basically became a national zine, right? Where I'm covering bands from all around the country. We're covering what was going on. And at any given point, like we really, by the time I graduated, we, we plotted it out, like based on all of our contacts we made from doing the zine, we probably could have driven across country and had a place to stay all along the way, known someone in every I'm city, sure. um, you know, had, and, and like, and also some of the stuff that just like, you know, uh, very early on Jimmy Eat World, I saw Jimmy Eat World play at a VFW hall in uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan in 1997. Um, they had just been dropped from from their first label and it was before Clarity came out. Um, so like was friends with them, got, you know, got a, a taped copy of Clarity before it came out, like a dub, like, like hey, here's oh, our new man, record. What do you think? So yeah. Special. yeah, yeah. It was, it was definitely those moments of being like, it was a great moment in time where, you know, the internet was small enough that it was like this this Venn diagram between the past 20 years of the underground music scene in the United States, which is built around touring bands and a touring network where like you literally would get like, you, you know, someone who knew people and you'd get a sheet of paper of names and phone numbers. And you're like, Oh, so if a band was touring and they wanted to play Reno, well, I'll call this guy and he can make you, you know, like that sort of thing. So you had that network, but then mm-hmm. layering the internet starting to emerge in there and the ability to email um, and the ability to talk to record labels, you know, via the phone and via email. Um, but then also you had the Usenet was very active. The alt, alt. Mm. music hardcore was where a lot of us. And that, and so it was it was a time period where everyone in the country was connected more than they'd ever been, but it still felt small and felt interconnected and felt personal and that you were talking to people in Seattle who knew you knew the same people and you were talking and now it's just so broken and disenfranchised and scattered and and micro yeah. you know micro communities. But at the time it was a it was a great moment in time where we were starting to leverage technology to do what what had been done before us for twenty years. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Again, again, having having the ability with the tools that you had to kind of take something to the next level yeah. that may have seemed unattainable prior to that. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a quick break. And then there are other aspects of your life that I want to ask you about that I'm super curious about you know, in, in regards to technology. Don't worry, Ron, uh, in a second. All right. So, Ron, in my time uh, being your friend, I have learned that you are, well, I mean, obviously you are a huge fan of Android because we've sure. been doing an Android show for together for 14 <laughs> ish years and counting. Yeah. Um, also that you have a, a fascination for pinball, which actually ties into something that you're uh, very actively um, creating uh, right now. Tell me, tell me a little bit about like where that kind of fascination with pin, pinball started. What, what is the birth of, of that story? And then we can talk a little bit about Scorbit. Yeah, well, so from on a pinball standpoint, um, that's actually more relatively new in terms of my life, you know, as, as it okay. is, you know, like, like, um, and by new for the past 15 years, <laughs> not 20, like yeah. podcasting and, not, and right. all these other things. But, um, uh, but yeah, but I, uh, so I, so the, I remember the first time I played pinball was ironically at Comdex in 1987 when my dad, uh, was attending the conference and, and this is how different the world is. My dad would go to these trade shows and bring me and leave me in the hotel while he went to the trade show and did his stuff. And like oftentimes it was the same hotel as the trade show. And I have many, many memories of like sneaking onto the the, the exhibit floor comdex and like being chased by security because no kids were allowed, like that sort of thing. But um, <laughs> inevitably, I would always get to the hotel and I would find the game room. Right. Mm. And I remember being in Atlanta for Comdex in that game room. I, I don't remember the hotel um, and playing Gauntlet. 
and playing like whatever arcade oh. games were there. And there was a Cyclone pinball machine. And if you're familiar with Cyclone, that's the one that's kind of uh, themed after like an old time, um, not carnival, but like amusement park. And it's one of the mid 80s pinball machines that actually had a voice uh, synthesizer in it. And, and every couple of minutes when it wasn't being played, a voice would go, ride the Ferris wheel. Oh, and yes, so, I know that. Oh, yes. Right? Okay, okay. So <laughs> I used to manage a movie theater way back when, and we had that pinball machine yep. in the movie theater because I always heard that. And I played it many, many times. Now I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Ride right. the Ferris wheel. Ride right. the Ferris wheel. Yeah. And so, oh, really? um, and so I played it there. But I was ten, and I didn't know what I was doing. And it's pinball is actually hard unless you know what you're doing. Um, yeah. And that was my earliest memory of pinball. Um, and then, honestly, never really got into it until when I was living in San Francisco. I lived in the Lower Haight back when I was working at Revision 3. And anybody's familiar with San Francisco in the Lower Haight, there's a uh, institution uh, dive bar there called Molotov's, um, which was my local bar. It was right across the street from my apartment. And uh, they had two pinball machines in the front of the bar. And I never really paid much mind to it. And then um, one night, one of um, my buddies who, who worked at Dig at the time, Dig.com at the time, um, he, he and his wife and uh, girlfriend at the time and, and me were just there drinking and there was a medieval madness pinball machine, which was made in 1995. Um, that was there. And we just like, well, let's, let's play pinball. So we're hitting around and now I'm able to like realize the kinetic movement of pinball. And, you know, like I play video games. I play, obviously I play computer games, play video games, but at this point I'm trailing off. Like I, I had an Xbox, Xbox 360 and Wii and all that sort of stuff, but I'm, I'm trailing, I'm, I'm aging out of the gamer mindset. Right. But I still mm -hmm. love games. And the great thing about pinball is you put in a quarter, you put in a dollar and you've got three or five balls and that's the game. Like it's contained. You don't have to spend mm -hmm. 24 hours you know, attached to a console to play through every moment of the game. Um, and realizing the physics of it, the physicality of it, and that, it, oh, if you hit the ball at this angle and bounce it off this thing, it goes in there. And then in that one night, we'd happen to do the things to trigger multi-ball, which is the, the 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 game mode where instead of one ball, you get three balls and it's and it's chaos. We're like, oh my God, there's so many balls, blah. And because of the internet, now we're on our phones and I'm looking up the rules and I was like, oh wait, wait. And I'm telling my buddy Brian, I'm like, if you hit that target and then hit that ramp, this will happen and see. So it's doing the cause and effect, and we really yeah. we really kind of fell in love with it. Um, then another, and so we, so we kept on going back to the bar, playing pinball, trying to figure it out. At the same time, one night, a guy moseyed in and just blew the machine up, got like a, a hundred billion points. And we're like, who is this guy? And we met him. We talked to him. Turns out he was a, a former world champion pinball player, like in <laughs> the PGA tour equivalent of pinball. Uh, you know, in 2011 or whatever, he won the world champions, this guy, Andre, who's amazing and is a, a friend of mine now. Um, and so then that made us realize, oh, there's a competitive aspect to this. There are people who play in tournaments and go do things. And then at the same time, I don't know how we found out, but we found out that there was a pinball league forming in the upper hate. Um, there's a place called Free Gold Watch, which is a, a silk screening uh, a store, a silk screening like uh, t-shirt, uh, not factory, but like a place where a guy silk screen t-shirts. Mm -hmm. And the owner was really into arcade games and had five pinball machines of his own that he put in there. And the, the local pinball community was getting together and starting a, a weekly league, kind of like a bowling league, where every Wednesday night we go to Free Gold Watch from 7.30 until 11 and play pinball with each other. And, and wow. you, know, you got points and all this sort of stuff. And little did I know, I was stepping, much like the music scene, I was stepping into a community and a scene that had local city-based scenes as well as a national, you know, kind of a tour that was happening um, and just open open opened my eyes to this world of, you know, this guy, Andre, who's a world championship pinball player. The world championships happen in Pittsburgh and every year in Pittsburgh, there's an enormous tournament called Pinburg and, and it's like all these kind of things and just got more and more into it and more and more, having more fun learning the rules of every game, the different errors, how stuff works. Um, and just really just falling in love with it as a hobby. And so for years I just played in the league just for fun. Um, mm -hmm. but then much like, as my wife likes to point out, I, my my uh, I, I have a very bad history of turning my hobbies into work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so one day I was in Free Go Watch and I was playing my buddy Russ on on Star Trek, uh, a pinball machine based on the uh, Chris Pine Star Trek movies. And my buddy Russ beat me and he got a really high score. 
And he goes, oh, wow, awesome. And he pulls that. I'll never forget. He pulls out his phone. It was a Samsung. Uh, it was a Samsung Galaxy, by the way. I'll never forget it because mm-hmm. he, he was my Android buddy. Um, and he pulls out his phone and he opens up a text file where he has a list of the names of games and a number next to them. And he was manually keeping track of his high scores on every game he played. And he had just beaten his high score on Star Trek. And I watched him do this. I'm like, what are you doing? And he explained it to me. And in my head, I went, ah, oh, shit, that's an idea. Right. And so, <laughs> so then at that point, at that point, I, I really, I was like, I want to make an app where you can keep track of your pinball scores. Like that, that was the, that was the germ of the idea. Um, yeah. And uh, so I talked to my buddy, Brian O'Neill, who worked at Dig and the guy that was at Molotov's with me. Um, he didn't want to do it. Um, but I was like dragged him kicking and screaming. I worked with a couple developers trying to get it done because again, I love technology much like music. I can tinker with HTML. I can tinker with JavaScript. I can tinker right. with, 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 with Python. I'm not a developer. Like I'm not, I'm right. not a designer. So I needed people to help me do it. Um, and then I, uh, happened to be hanging out with Jay Adelson, who was the CEO of dig and this, and the, the CEO or, or the founder of revision three. Um, and he and I were hanging out. And he was, it was after he had left Dig and he was thinking of his next thing and he had a, a bunch of startup ideas that had and he had an idea of like a global leaderboard, kind of like a Strava for video games kind of thing. And I was like, well, I've got this idea about pinball. And he's like, oh, that's cool. And then we just kind of went our separate ways. And then um, I dragged him to California Extreme, which is a uh, ar- retro arcade pinball show in San Jose because I knew he liked retro video games and he wasn't really into pinball at the time. And I'm like, you got to come check this out. I'm like, you got to come check this out. And so he loved it, fell in love with the scene the way I did. And as we're walking around, I'm like trying to get his advice and like see if he can open some doors to me and to get this app made. And he's like, yeah, no, he's like, I know you want to do that, but apps are boring. Everybody has an app. He's like, what would be cooler is if we could, and he was getting into IoT at the time, like internet mm-hmm, of things. Mm-hmm. He's like, what would be cooler is if we could, if you could make a device that went in the pinball machine to connect it to the internet so you didn't have to type in your score. And then that was the aha moment. And, and you he, were like, yeah, that would be cooler. No, and then he was just like, and then he was like, oh, well now we need to do, we need to build this. And then so, so Scorbit was born and that was 2015. Um, and so here we are. I can't believe that it's already almost 10 years. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, the, well, the first, we didn't launch publicly until 2020. So okay. for five, five years we spent researching and working with uh, electrical engineers. There's a, uh, actually uh, a guy on our board of advisors who was an early contributor to the project. Um, we found this guy who was an electrical engineer who had built an, uh, an interface for pinball machines to uh, change the displays, like whatever. So really knew the inside of pinball machines. Turns out he works at NASA. And is like a literally a rocket science, like literally a NASA engineer. And so he helped us, you know, kind of figure out some of the stuff that we needed to do to figure out how we wanted to do. So we spent five years. We got the patent for what we did. I have a patent in, in my name and Jay's name for, for this work, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we then we finished. We did the first rev of the app and then we launched. We were actually going to launch a week before the pandemic started. <laughs> and so we stopped because people were, people stopped going to play pinball. And yep. so we held back. And that would have been a horrible time. Yeah, absolutely. So we launched mid pandemic. Um, and then we've spent the past, you know, three years learning and testing. And um, now we're working on kind of like the next phase of the, of the company, like the next pl- big plan of what to do with it. But um, it's just, it's just, it's just fun. And again, it's another case of me having an interest in something and using and the technology being available and the technology unlocking the ability to do something with it. So, yeah, well, I, I give you so, so many props for taking this idea and go and going head first into hardware. Now, granted, you have a wonderful partner to do this yeah. with. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's really important. I think, uh, you know, I've had a lot of ideas and it's like, I God, I have no idea where to begin, and I know if I just do this myself, it's going to fail. So the, yep. the value of pulling people in to to be your support mechanism, to be your team, is is huge on something like this. And yeah. I mean, you know, you're almost ten years later, and I mean, you have an actual hardware product. It works with pinball machines. Like it's yeah. a huge accomplishment. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Every time we we've I th- we've made uh, you know several, we made a few hundred, more than a few hundred of the devices. Manufacture, you know, did the design, China, send them off to China, get back to the, the, the boards and all stuff like that. Every time we get more in stock, we sell out. So clearly, we're doing something right. Um, That's awesome. You know, we got we we've got a great uh, community of people using the app. Um, there's a thing called virtual pinball. I don't know if you ever heard of this, but people mm-hmm. have have coded pinball machines in an emulator, and then they build 
a, a pinball machine where the the play field is a is a screen and you can play any pinball game in the world. So we built an API to connect to virtual pinball, and so virtual pinball has embraced us. So we, that even like opened up our community even larger. And we've got some really really cool stuff coming, you know, in in the works that I think is going to you know make this you know hopefully knock on wood blow up and uh, be like a nice you know re- really nice nice little business that we that created that is mainly rooted in the love of playing pinball and promoting people playing pinball like that that's that's the whole mission statement is to get more people playing pinball. So yeah, I absolutely love it. And and like you said, um, turning your your passions and your your the things that fire you up into. Yeah, that, that's career. that's what it is. I mean, like, I mean, I've I, you know, I've had the I've I've been very lucky to be employed since college, like to have jobs. Um, I've worked jobs that are just like jobs, right? Where it's like, oh, mm-hmm. I, you know, I spent seven years working for a hotel company, working in marketing, right, and that sort of thing. I didn't love it. I wasn't passionate about it. It paid the bills, but ultimately, it became suffocating. And I realized that the times I was happiest was like when I was in my dorm room making my zine or mm-hmm. when I was, you know, working on my web, my other, we didn't even get a chance to talk about, but the other website, I fanboy, um, all mm-hmm. about comic books. Like I built that website mm-hmm. with my buddies cause I loved comic books. Um, and what I found is that when you're working with something you're passionate about, it doesn't feel like work. You're excited to do it. And the, the, the results are that much better. So I feel infinitely very lucky that I'm able to take pinball and make something work even my wife makes fun of me but like turn it into work because like at the end of the day be like ah it's pinball like i can't i can't get too upset you know (laughs) well but you're but i but i should also say you're you're lucky in that when you've done that with ifanboy and comics when you've done that with scorbit and pinball um android and android faithful you know because i suppose that is a business as well or podcasting about technology in general you haven't encountered what some people do when they take their passion and turn it into work which is it turns them off of their passion It, it kind of unplugs them and detaches them from that passion that existed before the war it yep. becomes work yep. and you know detaches i mean how how have you been able to avoid that um i think a couple of things i think um i think definitely mature emotional maturity is a big part of it um i joked you know like you know for you know for example i've worked in comic books i've worked for image comics and marvel and stuff like that um mm-hmm. I, I always said that at the point I had those jobs, if I'd gotten those jobs five years earlier, I wouldn't be emotionally ready to do them because I needed to split and you need to compartmentalize your love for your love for the thing with the realities of a business and re- recognizing that even though you love that comic book, it's still a widget, it's still a cog and it's got to sell and it's got to have, you know, a strategy behind it. Um, mm-hmm. And so like, com- I, I don't know if it's healthy or unhealthy, a, 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 a mental health practitioner, practitioner could tell me if compartmentalization <laughs> is good or bad, but that's what I've been able to do. Like you kind of put the love over here and you put the business over here. Um, and then at the same time, all remembering again, like I said, remembering why you're in it, you know, that, that, you know, we're like having pinball be a part of my work is at the, it's so, I'm so lucky to be able to play pinball and say it's work and be able to do it and, and being aware of that and not letting it grind you down. Um, and so sometimes that means taking a break and stepping away and like going back and it's like, okay, I'm not gonna think about the work. I'm just going to play this game and remember what I love about this, uh, this technology. So it's definitely mental gymnastics. Uh, but I seem to have figured out the balance, I think. So, well, that's important. Balance is a, is a key component. Um, I know that we only have a few more minutes here, but I did want to ask you, and I think it's it's sure. kind of a good ending um, to the interview is that another thing that you are very passionate about um, is Disney and uh, Disneyland and going to the resorts, <laughs> Disney World and everything. Yes. And so specifically t- related to technology, I guess the question that I want to ask you on this is, is there a technology that you see that you interact with that you uh, that you appreciate uh, on a certain level when you go to these places because I know they have like the wristbands that kind of track where you are and I mean Disney is a it's you know it's a fun experience but there's a ton of technology that drives that experience and it keeps getting more and more complex as the years go on what, what do you think about that? When you go there, are there things that you marvel at from a technological perspective? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the great thing, what I love about Disney from an amusement park standpoint is the, uh, the separation from reality and the created environment that you're walking into, right? The idea of escapism and the idea of 
the, from the moment you walk through, the moment you get off the parkway or the expressway to the moment that you go to the hotel, that you go to the amusement park, it is a completely thought through and crafted experience focused purely on joy, right? Which is so, which is so great. I, I, you know, I think back to the first time I went to Disney in the eighties and just being baffled walking through Epcot and not understanding how there's music everywhere, but I don't see any speakers. Right. And I remember being a kid, I was like 10 years old, rooting around in the landscaping at Epcot to find the speaker that was embedded in the bush that you're not supposed to see, but the music is just present. And, and then like, oh, okay, I see someone put that there. And the idea of crafting and yeah, the curation of the yeah, experience. And, and, and the yeah. way they transition, the way you walk through each of the different lands and like how the pavement changes and stuff like, like I, that whole, that whole, the, the creativity that goes in that just, just really sparks so much of my imagination. And then you're right, Disney, the Disney park side of the, their business is a very, technology can be a very technology forward company at times they can be very technology backward at times too but that's another conversation but um mm. uh and it's great now having children of my own and taking them to disney and then now like they have the magic band plus which you know uses rfid and you know the first magic band was just like you use it to tap in you know matter how i pay for the subway now you just that's how you got into the park like your your admission your your ticket was tied to your your bracelet at the turnstile you tap your bracelet green light goes you can walk in that's cool but now they've got it so that it, there's lights and location tracking so you know i got my kids a little bracelet and we go on pirates of the caribbean and after the the drop you know after the boat goes down the thing and then you go into that scene of the pirate of the pirate ship attacking the town and shooting cannonballs every time a cannonball hit and blew up in the water their magic bands lit up orange and yellow and vibrated and they just lost it. They were just like, whoa, because oh, wow. yeah, it brought what you're seeing to this, you know, kind of half so kind of feedback. Right. Even and more so, immersive. Yeah. Right. And, and, and my daughter was like, how did that do that? Like, like that idea of how did they do that? That's what I love. And that, and, and yeah. they are always pushing that. And I may know how they do it, but like, whether it's a, something as simple as the Pepper's ghost uh, effect on the haunted mansion, mm -hmm. the, the, how do, you know, how, how are their ghosts here? Right. Whether you know how it is or whether you know the, the magician, trick or not the magician trip it's, it's still a, a, a wondrous experience and there's always something to drive that curiosity and that's kind of why i love it so yeah yeah that, yeah. that experience is yeah. definitely driven by curiosity and especially when you know when you're there as a young mind yep. oh man it's so overwhelming but the the amount of of uh detail that they go into to make that such a convincing otherworldly experience yeah. is so respectable. Yeah, 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 totally. I need I need to go back. It's it's, it's been fun. a while. It's, it's fun. I mean, unfor <laughs> unfortunately, there are pros and cons. I mean, it is very ex it's prohibitively expensive now. So it is. Um, yeah. But uh, but if you can afford it now and you enjoy it, it's fun. It's definitely uh, it's definitely. I, I made the mistake of taking my kids a couple of times, and now they want to go all the time. So I'm trying to like pump the brakes. I want them to, <laughs> to recognize how special it is. You know. So yeah, yeah. But at the yeah. same time, you enjoy it so much. It's yeah. kind of like oh, okay. Well, yeah. I, you know what? I could go again. Yeah. Yeah. So. I could be convinced. Yeah. Well, so. one thing that I love about you, Ron, is you still have a lot of like childlike um, um, wonder. interest in, <laughs> and wonder. And I don't know. It, you're just a fun person to to be a friend with and, oh, and to work you, with as, as much as, as I do. So yeah. I appreciate you in my life. And I'm so happy that you got to come on here and tell me a little bit more about you. I've learned. See, this is what I love about this is yeah. that I get to learn even more about the people I care about uh, through this show. So well, I'm honored to you, I, I'm honored to be a guest and an early guest. And I'm so excited you're doing <laughs> this. You know, I've been cheering you on um, for well before, you know, this even came, you know, started coming out. So uh, honored to be here. And yeah, and then just like, you know, that childlike wonder I get from Disney, I try to have technology, something that makes me excited, no matter whether it's yeah. something as dumb as the rabbit R1 or or as exciting as the next Android phone or whatever OpenAI is doing. Like there's just so much, there's all, generationally, there's always something exciting going on in technology for, personally for me, back to kindergarten. Like that first Apple II Plus, which I still have, you know, open doors to me and each technology continues to open those doors wider so yeah I yeah like indeed yep. well thank you ron um always a pleasure and Thanks. uh yeah i'll see you uh, on the next android faithful episode here in less yeah. than a week every tuesday we're here talking <laughs> android never gonna stop so <laughs> thank you jason <laughs> thank you ron big thank you to my friend our guest ron richards and uh, as for you watching and listening we could not do this podcast without your support 
The most direct way to support us right now is at our Patreon at patreon.com slash Jason Howell. There we offer ad-free shows, exclusive access to the interview live stream, the recording of the, the interview that you just saw, early access to videos, a Discord community, regular hangouts with me and the extended Texploder family, and a whole lot more. We also offer the chance to be an executive producer of this show. And you know what? You can like put that on your Twitter bio, do whatever you want with that information. Uh, you can do that just like this week's executive producers, Jeffrey Maricini, John Cuny, Katie Lake, and Bill Rudder. Thank you for supporting this independent podcast. Texploder podcast premieres every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on the Texploder YouTube channel with the audio podcast publishing to the feeds later that day. And really, you can find everything you need to know about the show at texploder.com. I'm Jason Howell. We'll see you next week on another episode of the Texploder podcast. Bye, everybody.